I paid $65 for this PC, which probably just looks like a normal Dell Optiplex, but this system features a CPU that I didn't even know existed. In this video, we're going to get this slightly rare and unusual PC cleaned up, and then test it out to see how well it functions as a desktop or home server in 2024. Let's get started. Now, if you're like me and you spend most of your day at your desk, it can really start to take a toll on your back. Fortunately, you can get a high quality yet affordable standing desk from today's sponsor, FlexiSpot. The E7 and E7 Pro standing desks are the perfect solution to mix up your work environment and keep you more comfortable and productive. With four different preset, oh, hold on. With four different presets, you can adjust your desk for standing, sitting, or any other position to get your desk in the perfect spot. These desks are really affordable, but that doesn't mean they're cheap and flimsy. The E7 and E7 Pro have basically no wobble, even at standing height. Plus, they can support up to 355 or 440 pounds respectively, accommodating almost anything you might ever need to put on your desk. They also come with a sleek cable tray and other cable management accessories to keep your adjustable setup nice and tidy. So if you're ready to quite literally elevate your workspace, use my code in the description to get $30 off an E7 or E7 Pro, or even $50 off the new E7 Plus. This is the Dell Optiplex 5055 small form factor, and it might look a bit familiar. You've probably seen other 5000 series Optiplexes like the 5040 or 5060, but the 5055 is unusual in that it features a first gen Ryzen CPU. Now you might be thinking, you said you didn't know that CPU existed. How could you not know about first gen Ryzen? Well, I am actually very familiar with the lineup of first gen Ryzen CPUs because actually the first new PC I ever built ran the Ryzen 7 1700, but the CPU in this system is actually the Ryzen 3 Pro 1300. The Pro series of CPUs from AMD typically only come in OEM systems. And while I did know about these in second gen Ryzen and up, I had never realized that there were Pro series CPUs in the first gen lineup. Now, unfortunately for you and me, the Pro versions of these CPUs don't really offer any features that make sense for average consumers. They mostly just include some security features that are useful in large business applications, which is why they only show up in OEM systems like this Dell Optiplex. Seeing AMD CPUs in office systems like this isn't incredibly uncommon, especially in modern times, but first-gen Ryzen really didn't make sense for these optiplexes because they require a dedicated GPU. That drives up the price and the power draw. So when I came across this system, I couldn't quite help myself, and I just had to check it out. The Ryzen 3 Pro 1300 has four cores and four threads, a base clock of 3.5 GHz, and a max boost clock of 3.7 GHz. That probably doesn't sound super impressive compared to other Ryzen chips, and I know a lot of you are probably already wondering about upgrades. Because this motherboard uses the AM4 socket, even 5000 series AMD CPUs will fit, but from what I can tell though, the BIOS for this Dell Optiplex never received updates to allow for newer CPUs. That being said, there are variants of this system with the 8-core 16-thread Ryzen 7 1700. Get subscribed. According to the seller, this system has 8GB of DDR4, a 256GB SATA SSD, and, obviously due to the lack of integrated graphics, a GPU of some kind. I booted it up with no issues, and after confirming that all the hardware was working properly, I decided it was time to give this system a bit of a makeover. The seller seemed to know a bit about computers, but it was pretty obvious that he hadn't cleaned this thing out, so I started by breaking the whole system down. As annoying as these proprietary OEM systems can be, I sometimes find it fun taking them apart. With all the little levers and buttons, it's like a fun little puzzle that can cut you. The 5055 small form factor is very similar actually to the HP ProDesk small form factor I've used a couple of times now, with this drive bay thing that sort of lifts out to expose the motherboard. The plastic caddy here is actually designed for two 2.5 inch drives, and has a proprietary power connector that's nearly identical to the HP ProDesk. With the drive bay removed, I was happy to also see an unpopulated M.2 NVMe socket. The Wi-Fi and Bluetooth adapter was seated in the first PCIe slot, and below that was a Radeon R5 430. After removing the 240 watt 80 plus bronze power supply, I removed all of the motherboard screws, but still couldn't get the motherboard out. Then I remembered that these OEMs often mount the CPU cooler directly to the back of the case, 
And I'm really glad that I didn't run this system for too long before cleaning it up because the thermal paste had basically turned into a dusty chalk-like substance. Even with the cooler off, I still had to remove this front little IO piece, but then I was finally able to get the fairly dusty motherboard out. It's actually not that bad of a board, with four DIMM sockets, three SATA ports, one M.2 NVMe slot, and two PCIe slots. I hate that the larger slot is at the bottom though, as that limits you to just single slot GPUs. After blowing out the majority of the dust, I wiped down and cleaned all of the components before reassembling everything. With it all cleaned up, the Optiplex 5055 is actually a pretty sleek, good looking system. I feel like I got a good deal for $65, but let's see how it actually performed. Before installing Windows 10, I was met with the BIOS, which I imagine this is what Linux power users must feel like when they have to use Windows. The UI, while looking pretty, was just awful to work with. After a fresh install of Windows 10, I opened up Hardware Info 64 to get some more insights into this PC. The first thing I noticed was that the Radeon R5 430 is really just a rebrand of the R7 340, which I believe is just a rebrand of another GPU, but frankly I wasn't expecting much here, especially not with just one gigabyte of VRAM. I was pretty happy to see that the BI16 PCIe slot actually supports a full PCIe Gen 3 by 16 connection, with the smaller PCIe slot supporting Gen 2 by 4 this means this system actually has a decent amount of expansion potential, although you will be limited to single slot half height cards. The system handled basic desktop work like a champ. Browsing the web was super snappy, and even 4K YouTube playback was buttery smooth. That might not sound that impressive in 2024, but the Radeon GPU actually doesn't support VP9 decoding, so all of the decoding was being done entirely on the CPU. I could have installed the h264 fi plugin like I've done in the past to let the GPU handle decoding, but seeing as that the Pro 1300 was already handling 4K VP9 just fine, I decided to move on to some simple benchmarks. I started with Cinebench R15, where the Optiplex 5055 with the Ryzen 3 Pro 1300 scored a 3 run average of 552. Now just having that number isn't very helpful, so for comparison I decided to use the HP ProDesk 600G3 with an i5-6400. An i5-6500 or i5-7500 might have been a better option, as you see those all over the place in these types of systems, but I only had the i5-6400. Still, these CPUs came out around the same time and are both true quad cores, so I figured that would make for a decent comparison. In Cinebench R15, the HP system scored a 463, which is around 16% slower than the 5055. In the Cinebench R23 multi-threaded test, the Optiplex 5055 was around 13% faster than the HP system, and 15% faster in the single-threaded test. But speed isn't the only measure. While running Cinebench R23, the Pro 1300 system drew 66 watts. That's over 30% more power than the i5 system. While just sitting idle in Windows, the Optiplex drew over three times the power of the HP system, idling at 36 watts. I also ran PC Mark 10, where the Optiplex outclassed the ProDesk in each category. I imagine this was due in large part to having a dedicated GPU, which also probably contributed significantly to the higher power draw. I should mention that the Radeon GPU was having some issues with its fan. It wasn't affecting thermals in any significant way, but it was starting to get pretty annoying. Plus, I was curious if a better GPU might help with both power and performance. I don't really have any good single slot GPUs on hand, but I did try this Quadro K1200 just to see what would happen. 
Sadly, it didn't really improve PC Mark 10 performance at all, and actually raised idle power draw slightly. With 4GB of VRAM though, I figured that it would be better for trying out some games and emulation. In Rocket League, I was seeing well over 100 frames per second on the lowest settings, but there were some noticeable frame time hitches. I set the frame rate cap at 60Hz to match my monitor, and bumped the settings up to try to get a little bit more of a real world experience, but even then I was still getting some noticeable hitches. Now as I expected, we're most likely going to be GPU limited in most circumstances, but I wasn't quite sure why I was getting so much stuttering with such low utilization. To give this GPU more of a chance, I moved to the much older Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, where I had a really smooth 60 frames per second. Not that that's saying much for a CPU that was released almost a decade after this game came out. To try and utilize the CPU a bit more, I gave PS2 emulation a shot with PCSX2. In MX Unleashed, I had no problem running at 60 frames per second at a 3x render scale, but had to bump it down to 2x and need for speed most wanted. Still, the GPU seemed to be what was really holding things back. Next, I wanted to see how this system might operate as a home server. I also wanted to see what the power draw would look like if we removed the GPU entirely. To do this, I dropped in an NVMe SSD and installed Proxmox. Then I removed the graphics card as well as the Wi-Fi adapter and optical drive to try and bring power draw down as low as possible. But while sitting idle in Proxmox, the system was still drawing 35 watts. When running CPU frequency utils, freak utils, I don't really know. When running CPU frequency utils, I saw that the CPU cores were basically never downclocking to the available 1.55 gigahertz. So after some Googling, I installed sysfs utils and set the governor of each core to power save. And after restarting the service, the system power dropped down to 28 watts, which was sadly the lowest idle power draw I was ever able to get with this system. That's a bit of a bummer, but the CPU does at least support virtualization, and I was able to run a VM and pass through the Wi-Fi adapter with no issues. So you could absolutely run the system as a virtualization host and take advantage of those two PCIe slots for pass-through. However, doing that without integrated graphics is a bit of a pain in the butt. I installed Jellyfin on top of Debian 12 to see how the CPU might handle transcoding. Without integrated graphics, the Ryzen 3 Pro 1300 obviously isn't capable of hardware accelerated transcoding, but it had performed pretty well up to this point. I was hopeful that it might be able to just use brute force to transcode its software, but that wasn't the case. When transcoding 4K 10-bit H.264 down to 1080p, the Ryzen Pro was able to transcode at around 28 frames per second, which would be okay with most movies. However, with anything at 30 or 60 frames per second, you would definitely see a lot of buffering. When transcoding 10-bit H.265 down to 1080p, the Pro 1300 could only manage 20 frames per second, leading to an unwatchable experience. While transcoding, the system power draw jumped up to between 50 and 55 watts. Now, not everyone likes to or needs to transcode, and direct streaming worked totally fine, as you would expect. There is a caveat when it comes to running first-gen Ryzen CPUs in home servers. I've come across many posts about people having issues with these CPUs crashing while sitting at idle, which home servers typically do quite a bit. I couldn't quite find a good answer as to whether or not this has been fixed in a Linux kernel or a GISA update or something like that, but I never ran into any issues when testing. To be fair, I've only been working on this video for a few days, so it's possible that I've just been lucky. So to try and test for the issue a bit more, I've kept the system running Jellyfin and have it monitored with Uptime Kuma. If I have any issues between now and about a week from now when this video gets published, I'll make sure to add an update here. If nothing happened, all is well. So what are my thoughts on the Optiplex 5055 and the Ryzen Pro 1300? Well, it might not really matter all that much, as these systems aren't nearly as common as their Intel counterparts, and the Ryzen 3 Pro 1300 is even less common. I mean, it's not often that I can only find a single eBay listing for a CPU. If you do come across this system or CPU, deciding whether or not it's a good deal, as always, comes down to the price. I paid $65 for this Optiplex, and that would have been totally worth it for me if I just needed a simple desktop PC for work, or school or whatever. It's probably more realistic that you'll find a better deal though on one of the Intel versions of these systems. Those seem to be cheaper, don't need a dedicated GPU, draw less power, and frankly will probably perform even better. Had I used an i5-6500 or even better, an i5-7500, I would have most likely had better performance than the Ryzen system while still drawing significantly less power. Now if you need a dedicated GPU, then those factors maybe aren't quite as meaningful. But the Optiplex 5055 really shoots itself in the foot by having the Bi-16 slot shoved up right next to the power supply, 
there really aren't that many great options out there for single slot half height GPUs. Now, as I touched on before, there is the potential to upgrade the Ryzen 3 Pro 1300 to a Ryzen 5 or even Ryzen 7 CPU, and who knows, maybe that will make this system much more compelling. If you liked this video, maybe give it a thumbs up and consider checking out my other content. You can also become a raid member either on YouTube or Patreon to get cool perks like early access to videos, behind the scenes content, and more. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.